<laughs> oh my god. I'm so sad that you guys aren't here from the beginning. <laughs> What's up, guys? It's Mike Frank with Berkshire Hathaway. Coming to you today with Heather Kelly dropping butter bombs and Christian Olsen. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> we were just reminiscing our cheeky cheeky parm parm comments from, I don't know, what was that three weeks ago? Longer than that. Oh probably. my God. Christian so with funny. those little buttered noodles. <laughs> 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 all right, all right. Anyway, so today we were talking about um, the housing market and the updates, things going on, kind of how to manage it and, and what to expect. And I don't know. I was interested to find out from Liv that in Maryland, statistically, over the last 12 months, the market has risen by 37.5%. Is that what it says? 37.8% yeah. in median market value. Shocking. Wow. Wow. Meow, 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 meow. So then... Where's the market going to go? So if somebody said to you, Christian, where's the market going to go in 2023? What would you say to them? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. It depends. Like, are they talking about interest rates? Are they talking about home prices? Things like that. I don't see home prices dropping more than they already have. Um, and I wouldn't say they dropped. It's just like supply and demand. Uh, right now, there's not as much demand. So you have more negotiation in terms of price, what you're going to pay for a home. But then on the other end, interest rates are a little bit higher. But it goes back to the video that we've seen or we saw this morning. Why bring up interest rates with some of these buyers when they haven't even dealt with interest rates before? Yeah. Well, I think a better way to look at it is why are buyers work it, worried about the interest rate when they never had one? Right. And this thing, like maybe if they just if they talk to their parents, their parents would even say they have a low interest rate right now. <clears throat> mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. um but yeah. kind of yeah i think my mom bought her house at 17 percent. i want to say my like parents are probably like 12 to 15 yeah yeah it's crazy um but yeah if they've never experienced any interest rate whatsoever i think anything is better than paying someone else's mortgage so like boom roasted what are you gonna do um <laughs> well i think there's another thing like you said the market dropping, like it's not going to drop more than it has already. And I think that's a misnomer. But right? I wouldn't even consider it a drop. Well, right. The market hasn't dropped. What's dropped is the buyer's willingness to pay more than market value. Right. Right. Like last year, we know that buyers were paying over what the value was for the home because they wanted to secure it. They wanted to get into it. And that was a real opportunity because if you did that in 2020, you would have paid, let's just say you paid 20% over value. So a three hundred thousand dollar home, you paid three sixty, yeah. and that's insane. But that same home today is selling for three seventy seven. Yeah. So it's like, what's the difference? Yeah. So now today, instead of listing the property for three eighty or three ninety nine and having it sell for four forty, it's selling for three seventy seven because that's the market value. Right. And I think that's where people are getting lost is they're focusing on this idea of overpaying. I, the reality is that. We're actually paying a fair market. What was, so we're talking about something different, but to reel it back to like interest rates and stuff like that, what was the number that she said of a difference between a 5% interest rate and a It was, like, it a was like a dollar, was it a dollar 50? Dollar 25. It's a dollar 29. NBD. We're close. Oh. We're, we're close. It's right. a hell of a lot of me. But, so, <laughs> so the question becomes, if you have a buyer that's looking at a market and they're saying, hey, I can get locked in today at 5%. What is my monthly payment on that 5%? Well, I'd run the numbers. So it's, let's just call it like, roughly $5 for every thousand. Right. And what she's saying is that at 7%, now it's, now it's $6.29 six. Okay. for every thousand. I remember because you had given me some scale yeah, way like back in the day. Yeah. See if um, I can find it. I have it taken down. It's like... Five dollars for every thousand, and then every twenty-five thousand would be, or sorry, every five thousand would be twenty-five bucks. It's also like if someone wanted to increase their price, kind of like you could easily, in the snap of a finger, know how much it's going to change. Without right, re exactly. Redo the numbers. So, like, if this thing would load, I would be able to show you. It's a PDF. But also, like, I think people are just looking so much more into it than really like you need to right yeah. because who wants to look at a chart like this right la, la, la. um so at is that five percent table yes okay. so at five percent over a 30-year mortgage the monthly payment would be five dollars and 36 cents per thousand at seven dollars it'd be five dollars and 65 cents per seven percent 
it'd be five dollars and sixty five cents. There's sorry, six dollars and sixty five yeah. cents. So a dollar twenty nine per thousand. And that's for a two percent rate increase. But we're seeing interest rates in the fives, consistently in the fives, yeah. which we haven't for many, many moons. We're even seeing force for some people. Yeah. Especially when you take advantage of good programs. Right. And I think that what's happening right now is people have been beat over the head for the last four or six months where, oh, your lease is expiring. You don't want to buy a house because the market's really bad. I well, think that's what Nana said at yes, Thanksgiving. That's what, okay. I was going to, they're talking to the wrong people. Right. They're talking to the wrong people. They're getting this idea and then like they're looking way too far into it. Like, in terms of price dropping, where the market's going, it's just like supply and demand, honestly. Like every person can have a buy down program. There's so many things you can take advantage of. But if you're not talking to the, like anybody having certain conversations about what you can do, what your position is, like all your talk is just bullshit. And what, maybe even your opinion too. But yeah. like you got to talk to a, a local expert or just someone that's in this as their profession. I would even say someone that you trust. Yeah, because 100%. if you trust Nana and that's the one that you're going to take your advice from, it doesn't matter who else you talk to. It doesn't matter how many times I beat you over the head with market stats and I show you and I can lay it out for you. Nana is going to be the one that you trust. Yeah, maybe we got to start prospecting Nana. I mean, probably, you know, she's probably looking to downsize soon. Put her in the boomtown. <laughs> hey, <laughs> for those of you that don't know, boomtown is our program, not like an analogy for something weird. Anyway, God, I have a full time job. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I think there's a lot of opportunity presenting in 2023. And you know what's crazy? A lot of people that I've been meeting up with or even just chatting with like uh, friends, family, even past clients are like, oh, how's business? Mm -hmm. Like, it's great. Mm -hmm. Like, crushing it. Well, it's all on how you how you look at it, right? The very first thing that, that you learn in real estate is uh, you're at the grocery store and they say, oh, you know, you're a real estate agent. And you're like, yeah, I am. And they're like, oh, how's the market? Well, your response is always, well, it depends. Are you looking to buy, sell, or invest? Yeah. Because the market's going to be different for everything. But if you say to me, like, how's your business? I'm going to be like, oh, it's great. Right. Like even if we just lost five deals, if someone just quit and like we had to terminate someone like it's great. Because what else am I going to say? You think I'm going to sit here and be like, oh, my God, the market's <laughs> awful. <It's terrible. laughs> right. Like, thanks, John, for Break asking. down in tears. <laughs> right. Right. And, I, and moreover, I would say the person that responds in that way, you don't want to hire. Not only because you don't trust them, but because they have the mentality of limited opportunity. Yeah. And yeah, here we are in 2023 looking at nothing but opportunity. It's an interesting consideration because earlier I said something about there's a expected increase in listing inventory of over 22%. And that's such an opportunity for a seller. In some ways you think, well, more supply equals less demand equals lower home prices. Well, it's, it's an opportunity to showcase the value of your home and it heightens the reason that you would hire someone that you trust to represent you. Do you think that that would be the time to list your home or do you think the ideal <clears throat> time would be before that in order to beat the extra inventory and competition? I'm a big believer that listing your home is about timing. Not timing the market, but like timing your own transition. I just met with a couple over the weekend and their house is beautiful. I mean- yeah, we could improve it. Yeah, we could paint it. Yeah, we could do all these different things. But if they're not ready to do that, what's the difference? What's the market does? Let's rush, 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 just so you can go make a couple bucks. What about the quality of life? What about enjoying the process or experiencing the opportunity that you have to share your home with the right buyer? Not feeling like you're rushing through it. I think there's something to be said for you're on the fence. Let's get you off the fence. Let's get you in the market before the rest of the sellers come to the market and there's something else to be said, Hey, we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. There's going to be great buyers in the summer. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure that we don't miss those buyers by waiting until the fall. Mm -hmm. But if 22% market rise is what we're up against, let's be up against it. And let me show you how we're going to make it work. Yeah. Instead of being from the limited belief of, I have to beat them. Yeah. Something that I was seeing on there that was interesting was saying that we'd be transitioning into a buyer's market and it might just be because i'm newer in the business but i was thinking we were already in a buyer's market well what qualifies a buyer's market so i was basing it off of the fact that i went i started in covid so mm -hmm. you're seeing like 
sellers have the upper hand. Everyone's like battling to the knife the to get mm-hmm. that property. And as you've seen, buyers having more options and more things to look at, and they can sit here and go to 20 showings and then be like, we're going to buy the 21st and we haven't even seen it. Right. I was basing my assumption off of that. Thoughts? I mean, for our experience, yeah, I would say this is the closest thing or the only thing I've experienced of a buyer's market. <laughs> Under but, your logic, but I've I, never experienced a seller's market. Okay. You wouldn't say so that COVID? COVID? Under your logic, I've never experienced a seller's market. Explain more. You can't just say that. So I got licensed 10 years ago in 2013 and everyone knows that it's been a bull market for the last 10, 12, 15 years, right? Ever since 2008, the market crashed, economy collapsed, everything went haywire. Real estate has been growing year over year over year. The market stats prove it. Aren't we on like a 40 year high? Probably. That'd be great. Anyway, um, so under your argument, where I have lived the last 10 years would be a, a buyer's market the entire time. Uh, you're still not explaining anything. You just reworded. Nothing, the thing you said nothing's the changed in the last 15 years. It's always been growing. There's always been marketability. There's always been lower interest rates. There's always been opportunity. But there's been no change of inventory availability. And what I mean here is, in 2020, there was limited inventory. How do we rate? How do we measure inventory? Uh, days it, on market. No, I was gonna say. Uh, I mean, not m- days on uh, market. Month, uh, months of inventory. Months of supply. That's what it yeah. Is. Right. And so, if you look at months of supply, like a pregnancy, one month of supply, very, very seller heavy. Right. Like, there's not a lot of supply. There's a lot of demand. Like, if we didn't list anything more in the next month, we'd be out in a month and a half. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So there's a lot of demand. Of course, that's seller heavy. That's seller focused. But what you're saying is now there's more inventory coming. Mm -hmm. And so now it's going to be a buyer's market. Well, the logic is yes, but if we can't get to nine months, we won't go all the way mature. And so the tipping point of the scale is five to six months. So at at six months, it's a heavy buyer's market. At nine months, it's a buyer's market, like flat out, straight up. Seller cannot sell their home. There's so much inventory. There's more inventory coming to the market than there are buyers willing to swallow it up. Sellers are going to start losing money. But where we are today, we're still floating around two months of supply. I don't know that I've ever seen five months of supply. What's the most you've seen? I don't know. Because I don't know that I was paying attention to the inventory when I was, you know, two, three, so four years in the business. I want to say when I started, there was less than a month, but I could right. be capping. Yeah. I mean, we're talking, there were there were points in COVID, depending on who you talked about, depending on what market sector you were looking at, you were looking at like 0.7 months. Now, here's yeah. a question. Do you think this is the new <clears throat> normal for a buyer's market in the next two, three years? Well, I think that this market that we're in today is an example of what we're going to see over the next many years. And I think that there's a lot of factors driving that. The first is there's not enough homes in our marketplace for the people that live here. Point blank. Like there's not enough. It's almost like like New York City. We know there's not enough inventory, but they just like bunk up and double up and they go into apartments and like minimize. Yeah. In Baltimore, they don't. So people are reluctant to take shortcuts because of the availability of space. And so all of a sudden... There's just so many buyers and there's not enough homes. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Regardless of the inventory availability, physical homes, physical people living in them, there's an imbalance. So for a long, long, long time here in Maryland, we're going to have that imbalance if we ever overcome it. What I think we're going to see is we're going to see us creep towards three and four months, which I know for a fact, four years ago, we were at four months of supply. And that back in like 2018, 2019, it was trickling down towards three, trickling down towards two and a half, but it wasn't one. But again, by statistics, five months is a buyer's market. And we're nowhere near that. We're not even remotely close to that. So what I'm looking at is buyers have more opportunity to make educated decisions. Yes, agreed. That's fair. Buyers have more availability to choose. Yes, agreed. Buyers have more, um, less concern for sort of being pigeonholed and buying something. More 
able to be flexible in their search. But something that I heard this morning that I will continue to do and maybe start doing more of, this is how this works. Uh, Two years ago, you had to make an offer, write the list, the offer on the hood of the car, sign it on your phone and get it submitted to the listing agent that day. Now we're not quite in that position. We have more time to think. But the question that I'm going to start asking my clients is, do you want to be the one that allows another buyer to think? And I'll, I'll give you an example. Myself as a listing agent, sorry for all those agents out there. This is the truth. Myself as a listing agent, I get an offer and I'm like, yes. And they're like, did you present it to your seller? And I'm like, no, I haven't even reviewed it. And they're like, well, you know, time is of the essence. And I'm like, right. If your buyer wants to back out, great. Let me know. But in the meantime, I'm going to be calling every other listing, every other agent asking if their buyer's interested. I'm not going to be sitting there like, we have an offer. Please send us an offer. I'm just going to be doing my job. How did your showing go? What did your buyer think of it? You see any opportunity? Are they pre-approved? Are they pre-qualified? Have you had the conversation with them about what this looks like, about what that looks like? Do they need closing cost help? And then I'm able to go to the seller a day, two days, three days, sometimes four days. An eternity later. <laughs> An eternity later. And I get to go to the seller and I go. you have to present it within three days? Don't make me say that on air. There's no time. Time is of the essence. That's what the contract says. There's no standard. I thought that was a... Uh... Oh, right in. Just how they have timelines for everything else. I could have sworn that it was mm -mm. three days. Mm -mm. I'm crazy. There's no write in for when the offer has to be presented I'm to the seller. So the offer is intended to be presented to the seller as soon as possible. And you should. You should let your seller know that you have an offer and that you're not messing around. The problem is that I educate my sellers and I say, this is how I'm going to work. And so I tell them, this is how I'm going to work. This is what you can expect from me. And they'll say something like, hey, I've seen so many showings. Do we have any offers? And I'll say, no, because we don't. And as soon as we receive that one offer, I don't run to the seller and say, hey, here's where we are. The seller knows when they're going to hear from me next. That's when I contact them. I even sometimes ask, do you want me to let you know if I have one offer before, you know, if we get an offer? And they'll say, yeah, sure. Send it to us. Okay. And then I'll send it to them and I'll say, hey, when do you want to chat? And they'll say, tomorrow's great. Because the seller's not in a rush. So I have the opportunity to cultivate for my seller. And what I'm cultivating, for those of you that think that I'm doing a bad job, what I'm cultivating is I'm cultivating the information for the seller to make the best decision. I have an offer. It's for 5% down conventional. It's for $20,000 less than asking. They're not asking any closing cost help. They're settling in a timeline that makes, work, that makes things work for the seller. All the great opportunities. Well, how do I know that I don't have an FHA buyer that's willing to offer $5,000 less than asking? How do I know that I don't have a VA buyer that's coming in at full price with some closing cost help? I don't. If I rush, 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 rush to present and I'm like, this is a great offer. It's conventional. They're putting 5% down. This is what they're working with and we should sign it right now today. I'm sacrificing the opportunity for my seller to understand. I'm, I'm sacrificing the opportunity for my seller to make the best decision. So flip the script as a buyer's agent. Do I want to be the person that says, hey, you don't have to make an offer today. You're not in a rush. It's a buyer's market. You could do anything you want. Take your time. Be flexible. And then they wait two or three days to get back to me and say, hey, we do want to make an offer on that home. And then someone else rushed their buyer through the process one day after we showed the property. They submitted the offer to the seller. They paid less than my buyer would have paid. And then the seller accepted it because my buyer wasn't acting aggressively enough. I think you need to find the middle ground there because I don't know if the term rush is... Like, well, so what I'm going to continue to do is the way that I set the expectation for the seller. I want to set the expectation for the buyer. Right. And I want to share with them. Hey, here are the options that you have. You can make an offer right now. We can get it to the seller right away. We could do this. We could do this. We could do this. Or you wait three or four days. Let's take our time. They're obviously going to choose the three or four day option. Of course they are. They're going to say, I don't want to be rushed. I don't want to feel like I have to make a rush decision. I don't want this. I don't want that. I don't want the other. Of course they are. I don't think I've experienced that. Well, but if you gave them the option, yeah, they would pick option B. And all I'm saying is, here's what I'm going to recommend. I'm going to recommend that you don't open the door for the next buyer to come in and undercut you. If you feel like this is a house for you, tell me as soon as possible so we can get the offer put together. Even if you don't want to sign it, 
Let's get the offer put together. Let's get it in your inbox. Let's get you the opportunity to review it so that you're not waiting on us once you've made the decision and we're not opening the door for another buyer. It's like painting the picture for them of what this process looks like so that we can be aggressive and not sit on our butts and say, oh, we're in a buyer's market. So if a buyer says to me, we're in a buyer's market, I'm not in a rush. I'm going to educate them. Hey, do you know what a buyer's market actually is? And they're going to say no. And I'm going to say it's months of supply. How many months of supply do we have today? And they're like, I don't know. I don't even know what that means. And I'm like, okay, we're at two. And they're like, that sounds great. I'm like, yeah, but a buyer's market is five. So we're not even halfway there. So your thought process is flawed. And let me tell you how I think it should go. And that's more of what I think we need to do. Heard. So like at Live Baltimore event, just do that. I kid. I kid, I kid. I kid, I kid. I think it's also interesting how dynamic our market can be. Explain some more. Like in your community, down in Dunkirk, a $540,000 house comes on the market. It needs some work. It's got a two-car garage. It's in the right neighborhood. It's priced appropriately. How quickly will that house sell today? Probably pretty quickly. Like a week, two, five? Um. I'd say within the month. Within the month? Like That's so under quick. contract and then off the market. That's so quick. But it also, like, I think it really comes down to the agent. Like, the listing agent or the buying agent? Listing agent. Okay. Um, and I think that really goes for any property. Like, you could say Calvert County, you could say Anne Arundel, you could say PG, Baltimore, Baltimore City, whatever, right? But, like, there's a lot of properties I walk into, and I can tell just from, like, how the property is set up. Um, even the listing online, like this is going to be here for a while yeah. and you can know like they're not going to do the work that it's going to take to get it sold. So like we can reference Calvert County and how like I think it's a great place to live. Like I grew up there, like it's a very profitable market. But if the agent's not doing the work, yeah. like you're fucked. Yeah. Facts. <laughs> and and like, I, I get what you're saying too. I don't, I don't disagree with what you're saying. What I'm saying is from the perspective of a buyer, you walk in and you know that that's kind of where you are in Dunkirk. Yeah. In Baltimore City, if you put that same property on the market, it will sit. Yeah. It will sit and it will sit. And the reason is It depends on the neighborhood. Even in the right neighborhood. Priced appropriately? We're not talking about like right in Canton, two blocks from the bars. We're talking about Canton. Right? Like if I have a eleven hundred square foot home on Rose Street, do you know where that is? Yeah, kind of. Over by the Pancake house yeah, 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 all the way up in the point. Yeah, yeah. It's a little bit farther away right from the bars. Boston. It's a nice house. It's south of the park, but it's like a nice house. It's south of the park. Like it's not special. It's not, you know, two blocks from the bars. It's not in the right location. It doesn't have parking. They were just talking a nice house, like just a nice house. That's a nice house. <laughs> <laughs> Versus the same house painted new fixtures new finishes the front door has a nice door handle a nice lock maybe it's a tech like a um a keypad lock or uh maybe they have a um the lion head gold knocker right right those are but so but these are things that like <laughs> make a difference when all other things have been taken off the table yeah and in in canton the reason that those two things would have such a big impact is because the desirability to live on rose street south of the park is no different than the desirability to live on you know um east ave south of the park if they were the same size house with no parking no rooftop everything else was comparable those two things are not different enough for most buyers to choose to buy one over the other unless one was in better condition. Whereas in your area, it's not as much about condition because it's about the house because there's a limited inventory in your area. And your average price point is higher in Calvert County, right? Right, but that's not necessarily why. What yeah. I mean is like, if you drew a map from your work, you said, I want to be 20 minutes from my work. You go like this in Baltimore City, you're talking about, Thousands feel, and thousands and thousands of homes. Okay. In Christian's area, you might only be talking about hundreds. If that. But I feel also naturally, okay, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like naturally with higher price points, mm -hmm. the amount of money in that community is higher. So they would have more expendable income in order to make the improvements. Oh, and I definitely don't disagree with what you're saying. Done. I definitely agree so with what like you're saying. So I feel like that's another big angle to that same mm -hmm. conversation. Which would impact the buyer pool. Correct. Now you're getting into like the psychology of buying and selling real estate, which I love. 
because it does make an impact. And for our sellers, sometimes the conversation is, hey, don't make that improvement. The buyer will do it for themselves. But if you overuse that thought, if you overthink that, you're going to lose opportunity. But I think as a buyer's agent, I feel like that's even like a value proposition by being like, hey, this needs this work done. Do you know what that value is going to add in if you were to do that? Like you will, your resale value is going to be much higher. Another way to look at that is, hey, this house is $20,000 less. Yeah, let's buy the one $20,000 less. Well, we could put the $20,000 into it. Well, where's the $20,000 going to come from? Yeah. Because if it's only $6.68 a, you know, per thousand, we're only talking about $130 an a month. Yeah. We're not talking about enough money to add up to $20,000 of actual improvement value. Yeah. So it's like all of these things play a factor. And when you get into the position differing between Canton and Dunkirk or Baltimore County versus Carroll County, there's so much dynamic that happens. Mm -hmm. And what I find is that our buyers almost like move in a certain direction. Like based on the market in Baltimore City, people kind of like start to filter out to the county. And based on the market in the county, people start to filter to like other counties or maybe into the city or they start to like, ah, I want to do this. I want to do that. But then everybody starts to say the same thing. Gentrification. Keep oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean in that way. What I mean is like for six months, I feel like Canton market is on fire. Yeah. And then for the other six months of the year, it's like sometimes a little bit more subdued. Do you think that goes hand in hand with like semesters and it could and everything with like what's it called placements for like right. john topkins and everything right like schooling and things of that yeah. nature of course um match day and things yeah, yeah, yeah but it could i think it goes more back to like the psychology the thought process the people that are thinking about moving all at the same time have similar activities similar attributes th similar things and then you go into like what's going to impact the market is it worth it to list today versus waiting the the common thing is like oh i'm going to list in the spring market well when is the spring market is the spring market april is the is the spring market and march what's your actual timeline to move right what yeah. about how much needs to be done to get your home ready to, to sell say. i mean timing your home is almost as bad as timing the market like timing trying to figure out the right time to buy and sell it's crazy and to me what we have today is the opportunity for buyers to understand that's the biggest difference. Do you think a lot of the <clears throat> timing the market, I'd say in the past two, three years, um, like the stock market has had a big change or big impact on trying to time the real estate market? I don't think there's such a thing. What? That's not the question I asked. Okay. Do you think trying to time the stock market, like what was oh, the, the GameStop, like understood. all those stocks, like selling the snap of a finger, right? do you think that idea, the people like my age, Heather's age, the younger crowd who just got into this mm -hmm. are now like, oh, let's time the real estate market. Do you think there has been any impact or any correlation between Over the two? Time. Just the fundamental idea of timing, not necessarily them being a similar market. Do you think? Because I'll talk to my friends who are in the stock market. Mm -hmm. They do some investing and they're like, um, like a couple months back, they're like, oh, it's a terrible. What the fuck? I'm working. I can't hear anything. You can't hear anything? No, I can. Um, it's like a terrible time to buy. Like it's just an awful market, right? And then now they're kind of like easing into it. They're saying, oh, I want to time the market. Like I don't want to pay a million dollars for a home. And then now it's like interest rates. So they're trying to find this excuse to time it. But um, I don't even know if you're listening. I was. Point. And this is always, every time I talk, <laughs> it's so fucking annoying. I, 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 I was it. listening. So the question that I'm wondering is if you feel like people are timing the market, because my thought is actually something I different. I don't feel that they're timing the market. <clears throat> I've talked to some people. Right. That's what they're saying. They right. want to try to do, or they have that idea. But I'm saying is the root of that idea coming from what we had experienced in the three years or the past two, three years I of the stock I personally market. don't think that, and I don't think there's enough statistics to support it. I think that what I'm seeing is people like that, people that are saying, I'm timing the market. They're the same ones that are saying, I want to buy multifamily. They're the same ones that are saying, I don't want to buy for my primary residence. They're the same ones that are saying, I want to invest, but I don't want to live. Because they're chasing this idea of success, whatever that means to them. And I don't think that it's wrong I just think that it's really freaking hard. If it was easy, everyone would be a stockbroker. Yeah. If it was easy, everyone would own, you know, 
20 plexes and there'd be millions of property owners all over the place. But yet there are people that own 20 and 30 and 50 and 70 units and they're selling them off like hotcakes, not because it's hard, but because they just decided they don't want to anymore. I think what we have today is we have an economy led by perception. Yeah. Okay. Misinformation, perception. I think that there's a lot of people that are chasing something. And the reason that they're chasing uh, timing the market is because they feel like they won't be successful if they don't time it appropriately. I also feel like they don't understand how the market or market growth really works. Kind of like the conversation we had last week about buying a home, right? Like even if you have a 3% growth on a $300,000 home, in a couple of years, it's going to be right. <clears throat> 309. Then after that, 318. Just so it goes back to the conversation about housing today, right? Like, hey, you're timing the market. How long have you been thinking about it? Oh, I've always been thinking about it. Well, why didn't you do it two years ago? Oh, it's a bad time to buy. Well, let's look at the market stats in the last okay. two years. Well, okay. Here's an idea. So you know how people, obviously, people just rent. They're throwing money down the drain. Like mm-hmm. it doesn't do anything for them. Mm-hmm. Well, combine that with the time. Like let's say they spent a year searching. They haven't transacted. Mm-hmm. That market growth throughout that year could mm-hmm. be three percent, five percent, but that's also adding on to your loss of not actually pulling the trigger on something or die, like getting into the market. Agreed. It's the same thing as um, being fearful for investing your money in the wrong thing will prevent you from investing your money in the right thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like I think that there are a lot of people, and it's young people for sure, but it's also successful people. Your um, buyer, I don't remember his actual name, the one that came in through Boomtown that was looking to invest. This he's, morning. Yes. He's looking to be aggressive, but yet he doesn't want to take it aggressively. It's like, why? Why does it sound attractive? Why is it something that you're worth like dabbling into, but not sinking your heart into? You know, if somebody told me that they were thinking about investing or thinking about buying and, and why didn't you buy last year? Well, the interest rates were, or the market was too high. Well, okay. Why don't you buy today? Well, the interest rates are too high. Okay. Well, what about tomorrow? Well, now I can't afford what I want to buy. Well, what about the next day? Well, the mar- the, you know, the condition of the property is less than I want it to be and I can't afford the repairs. Well, w- w- what if you just bought when the market was too high? what would it look like today? It's like what you said, but it's just a simple question. Yeah. And I think that there's too many people trying to do too many different things. Yeah. <clears throat> the amount of people that will call and say they want to invest in something, but they don't own a home themselves mm-hmm. is, I think, through the roof. Right. You know? It's and like, it's hard. Oh, for sure. That's why they don't own. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's a lot of a lot of thoughts out there and there are really, really successful people. And I'm not picking on Grant Cardone in this moment, but Grant Cardone will tell you rent don't own. Is this a, I know who that is. I don't know who this guy is. Millions of units. Like the dude has 50,000 units okay. that he owns in partnership and, and this whole thing. They're estate. super, super successful and very smart. And if I was at that level, I would never own either, but I'm not. Yeah. So when you tell me don't ever own a property, rent don't own, it's like, well, dude, I hear you, but if I rent, 100% of my money is going down the drain, and I don't have another source the of income. The fact that you can make that statement to the general public in that position and like have them, like, tr- like you want them to believe you. Right. Well, he wants like- them to buy into his program. What, which is, is even worse. Is that like just a rental it's program? A, it's or? a multifamily investment portfolio. It's a great uh, dude, super, super successful. I'm not knocking him. I'm just saying that sometimes I have young people that come to me and they're like, well, Grant Cardone says don't ever own your home. So I'm looking for a multifamily. And I'm like, all right, well, how are you going to afford it? They're like, well, I'm going to get a conventional mortgage and I'm going to put down 5% and I'm going to this and that and the other. Well, that's a primary home. Yeah. Well, no, I don't want it as a primary. So you're just taking it for face value. But also like think of this in perspective to like your life, right? Like, what? Just anybody, like just the time here on earth. If yeah. you want to buy this multifamily or investment property, uh, you're going to live in it for a year. Mm-hmm. Like, and then you can go do whatever the fuck you want. You can right. go invest into another property. A year investment of your time, your energy, your money. Right. And then you can go off and to do whatever the hell you want. You can get another property. You can go rent. You can do whatever. But that is like, <clears throat> that year is like your initial investment. And people make that out to be so much more than... Than it needs to be. Yes. It, it, this speaks to the same thing, which is I have buyers that buy a house and they struggle to buy 
200, 300, $400,000 house. When I say struggle, I mean, in some cases, they're scrapping together every penny that they have. Mm -hmm. In some cases, they're getting grant money from the state or from family or otherwise. Some of them just can't get their credit into a position that they can afford to buy. They do it. They buy a house. They struggle. Duh. And then I see them later and I'm like, how's the house going? And they go, oh my God, it's amazing. We just had a kid. We got a job. We got a raise. We got all this. We got all that. And all of a sudden, literally just in that conversation, I can say, okay, so you guys are making $40,000 more than you used to. I don't care how much they made before. It doesn't matter, right? You're making $40,000 more than they used to. And it's like, well, have you guys thought about putting that equity to work? Oh, and then you start having conversations about buying a second home, buying a new home. Uh, investing in property, Airbnb or otherwise. And it's like, all right, cool. So how much are you thinking about investing towards this process? And they're like, well, right now, um, you know, I'm not really sure, but um, maybe, maybe like six grand. And I'm like, you just got done telling me that you're making $40,000 more than you used to. Where the fuck is your money going? Yeah. Because they're not even thinking through the process. They're not even using the inventory, using the tools, using the opportunity to save and prepare themselves. They're just going through life, living life. And I think that's where like, is Grant Cardone leading a fallacy in my opinion? Yes, I think that he is because I think that it's hard to do what he's suggesting. But I think to your point, buy one, save your money. Like, let's say that you're cash flowing $900 or $1,800 a month on your multifamily investment that you moved into. Instead of lowering your contribution to $400, keep your contribution what it should be and bank that $1,800 a month. After 12 months, what are you looking at? You're looking at 20 grand, 21 or 22, right? You're looking at $22,000 sitting in the bank ready for you to reinvest, ready for you to take the next step. But 99 times out of 100, I tell my clients and they're like, oh, I've been renting a room Airbnb. Well, okay, well, cool. Let's go buy another property. Well, how much do you have to spend? He's like, well, 10 grand. I thought you were doing Airbnb. He's like, yeah, how's that working out for you? Oh, I made an extra 60 grand this year. Where the fuck did Where does it go? Yeah. Where did it go? Right? Like, help me understand where it went because you should be able to buy an investment property. I'm talking about you, Devante. Uh-oh. I know you're watching too. <laughs> I mean, that's true. Yeah. It's a true story of a true situation. Like people want to invest in the market. Buyers want to take the opportunity and like, oh, it's a buyer's market. Let me take my time. Let me think about it. But the reality is like, all you need to do is act today. Like I want to buy a house today. I don't know if it's going to happen, but like every day I wake up and I want to buy a house. Are you putting yourself into the right place to make that happen? Or are you waiting to time the market? Well, even people that are waiting to time the market, I feel like they don't understand sacrifice. (laughs) All right. Next show. Sacrifice. (laughs) Okay. Right. We get it. But like even the people that are like, when you go to them, they are, they're living in their Airbnb or doing Airbnb. They made 60 grand, whatever. Like they're not doing anything else to increase like their position in the market. Like they're not, they're like, Oh, I got this like all the fucking goodness. This Mm -hmm. one property. And cool, now I'm going to stay comfortably. And then they have this plan still in their head and by like, I'm going to keep investing, doing whatever. But then they're not making other progress after that. They're getting comfortable. And like, whether it's your first home, your second home, your third, fourth, fifth investment, like. So let's, let's talk about this as it relates to the housing market. The market's continuing to go up. You want a single family home. You only make 80 grand. It might be limited to afford that single family home on your vehicle budget that you have today. Have you ever eaten ramen? I've lived on my own since right after I turned 18. Don't do that. (laughs) So, no? Yes. Yes? Have you? Yes, of course. Bet. How much does ramen cost? Fucking, I don't know, less than a dollar probably. If you had to, if you had to, could you eat ramen for a month? For sure. Bet. Why eat steak ever? All I'm saying is like, if you want to time the market, you want to get into the market, you want to buy that nice single family home, you want to go and advance yourself, your life, your career, your opportunity, go eat ramen. It's not even that bad. I like it. Right? Like good fucking ramen out there. I tell you what. (laughs) It's good. But especially like, especially if you're getting like the the little packs, like our bodies do need a little more nutrition than that. No, but like, okay, so here's, here's an example, right? Buy ramen. Go get some veggies, like some turned away veggies, some second day veggies, like whatever your option is for 
getting affordable veggies, get some veggies, build out ramen, make some affordable meals, put your body through some sustenance, lose some weight while you're at it, and then go buy a nice house. Like it, it just, people are so focused on living in the moment that that's what causes the limitation that you're talking about. People trying to time the market, people trying to work within their means without their means. Yeah, It's just, I don't even understand it. Every time that I talk to a, a entry level buyer i don't care if they're young old it doesn't matter to me yeah. i want to shake them and i just want to be like look give me your money give me your money <laughs> give me your lunch money give me your dinner money give me it all all of it i'm going to put it into a piggy bank we're going to buy you a house and they're like yeah bet awesome and then i talk to them a month later and they're like oh i don't have any money like oh i had this expense come up like what dude some people uh, like that conversation and they go out and buy cars yeah. Buy like some massive TVs. Like, motherfucker, you want to buy a house? We just had a conversation last week, you know, and we've been working at this for months. It's I mean, farm. <laughs> <laughs> eat ramen, like put that into your diet, put it into your budget, put yourself into a position where the market doesn't dictate your outcome. So if the interest rates go down, great. Refi, shut up. If the interest rates go up, awesome. You bought a house today. I don't want to hear it. Like it's so difficult to listen to people talk about their limiting reason for not buying a house. I might get him on the David's Goggin kick. You see how hyped up he's getting? <laughs> I feel like at the end of the day, you're going to be paying at least a thousand a month to keep a roof over your head. You might as well be having that go somewhere as opposed to. I agree. Not. I agree. I also think that those people that want to buy multifamily, great. Buy a house for me today. And in the next 12 months, we'll look for a multifamily house and we'll find you the opportunity. We'll move you right into it. You know what I mean? Like, let's go. Come on. I don't have patience for you. And I, all I want to do like so passionately in my life is help people see beyond housing market stats. By the way, if you don't already, go to our website, frankoliverco.com, go to resources, go to blog. All of the information is right there. But it's crazy to sit here and be like, I want to talk about housing markets. It's like, well, do you want to buy a house or do you want to just talk about it? Let's go. Mm-hmm. Right? I feel very blessed to have bought a house when I did. And I wish that I would have bought a house sooner. And that's like the biggest thing for me is like, I wish that I would have bought a house sooner. But people hear that and they're like, you just in real estate. (laughs) I'm like, all right, cool. Did you open a bank account sooner? Like, what do you want to do sooner? You want to go like buy that Home Depot sooner or like invest into a, you know, restaurant? Like, tell me what's a better investment over 30 years. Help me understand. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense. I have a full-time job. (laughs) (laughs) Bye-bye. Anybody have anything else they want to add? Um, Andrea Soto and I will be starting a podcast here soon, too. When is she coming back? I don't know, but I miss her cute little face. Meow. Um, Well, she's been having so much fun. I can't wait to see her in the office, rejuvenated and excited. I know there's a lot of opportunity for her, and I can't wait to to see her capture it in 2023. She's rocking it. Oh, yeah. We're so proud of you, Andrea. Lit. All right. We'll talk to you guys real soon. If you don't already, follow me on Instagram at Michael Frank underscore underscore underscore. Go to our website. You can always reach us at frankoliverco.com. Christian, you want to share with them how they can reach you? Christian the Deadhead on Instagram. Keep it simple today. Oh, Heather. Wow. It's wow. Heather Kelly 230. Spelled with an E Y. On Instaworld? Yeah. And in case you guys don't know. I- I'm <laughs> Straight from Heather. Talk to you guys real soon.